right? This is the second hour of physics 1C for November 1st. Uh, we're now going to look at a problem. Um, what we learned in the last section was that we can find the torque on a loop of wire by finding um, the magnetic moment mu crossed with the magnetic field B. So rewriting these equations right here, we have a circular coil that's 0 0.05 meters in radius with 30 turns of wire. You're going to start seeing this expression show up more and more if you haven't already. Uh, turns of wire being the number of turns of wire in, in the loop lies in a horizontal plane. It carries a counterclockwise, as viewed from above, current of 5 amps. The coil is in a uniform 1.2 Tesla magnetic field directed to the right. Find the magnitudes of the magnetic moment and the torque on the coil. Uh-oh, we got this problem where I can't really... There we go. There we go. Okay, so... This is a very straightforward kind of plug and chug kind of problem here. Um, so we need to be able to calculate this magnetic moment of the coil. So let's do that. So the magnitude of the magnetic moment, it's kind of a mouthful, is 30 turns multiplied by the current, which is 5 amps. 5 amps. 30 turns. This is N. This is I. Multiplied by the area of the loop. It has it's a circle with a radius of 0 0.05 meters. So we're going to do pi times that squared. So we'll get something like, I don't know. We'll put this one on the calculator. So 0 0.942. The units for this are just amp time meters squared. There's no special unit for it. Well, I mean, maybe there are special units for it. I don't know. So that's the magnetic dipole moment. And to find the torque on the coil, because the magnetic field points this way and the magnetic moment points this way, the angle between the two of them, as you can see, is 90 degrees. So to find the magnitude of the torque, this is going to be equal to So that times the size of the magnetic field, which is 1.2 Teslas. And then we have to multiply by the sine of the angle between the two of them, which is 90 degrees. Okay, I'm just going to... Can you do it with i-hat and j-hat? Yeah, I can show you how to do that in a second. So basically we just need to multiply this times... 1.2 times the sine of 90. This is in radians, which is the pi over 2. So it's 1.13. And that's going to be in, hopefully, newtons times meters. But we have to kind of check. So we have Tesla's amp meters squared. Let's check out the units up here. So Tesla times amp times meters squared. A Tesla, if you don't remember what a Tesla is, you can use the equation that force is QV cross B, which gives you that the units for Tesla have to be F over QV. It's the units of a Tesla. One Tesla is then going to be equal to a Newton divided by a Coulomb times a meter per second, which is the same thing as a Newton divided by a meter times an amp. So if we put that into here, we have Newtons divided by meters times amps, 
multiplied by amps times meters, so you'll see that what's left over then is newtons times meters, which is the unit for torque. And there we go. Pretty straightforward. Things can get a little trickier if the angle is not 90 degrees, and you'll definitely see problems like that, or I already have maybe. Um, if we wanted to do this using I hat J hat notation, we would have to construct a coordinate system. So we could say that this is the x direction. We could say that this is the y direction right here. In that case, b would be equal to uh, 1.2 Tesla times I hat, and mu would be equal to 0 0.942 amp meters squared times j hat and then if we did torque equal to mu cross b we would get the same answer but we would have 1.13 newton meters and then we would have an i cross a j which you all know is k which means that the torque is such that it would create uh, the torque is in the positive uh, z direction, right? So that would look like this, which is to say that the, when the torque points like this, that's like a torque that causes the system to rotate in a circle that is counterclockwise from x to y. All right, any questions? Okay, I already talked about how dipoles work and how they line up with magnetic fields. Um, I guess one other thing that we can mention now that we've introduced this kind of idea of magnetic moments is that, uh, you, you know, if you think about an atom, this isn't 100%, the picture that I'm about to give you is not 100% accurate, but I think it's good enough to share in an introductory physics class. Just understand that sometimes we lie to you a little bit because the truth is a little too complicated. This is one of those moments I'm going to lie a little bit because the truth is a little too complicated, but... It's like a little white lie designed to teach you something. So think about an atom. Uh, inside of an atom, you've got uh, like a nucleus, right? So you've got your, your nucleus that has um, your protons and your neutrons inside of it. So you've got your nucleus. And surrounding that nucleus, you tend to have uh, electrons. And so let's think about just the simplest of all atoms. Let's think about the hydrogen atom, where in the side of the nucleus, all you have is a single proton. So inside of here, you just have a single proton. And orbiting that, you have an electron. So out here, we have a little electron. And it's moving around. It's got some velocity. But it's moving around. Now, if I have a negative electron that's flowing around like this, that implies that there is a positive electric current flowing in the opposite direction, right? So we can say that there's a current that flows like this. Now, if there's a current that's flowing around like that inside of an atom, that means that this atom has a magnetic moment. Can you all tell me what direction it would point? So if the current is flowing around like this, so coming, coming out and then going back in like this, so the current's going around like this, can you all tell me what would the direction of the magnetic moment be? Sweep your fingers in the direction of the current and your thumb will point in the direction of the magnetic moment. It goes down. No, I already said that the electron's moving to the right, but that means the current's going to the left. So you don't need to do any other changes. We're just looking at the current now. So I've got a magnetic moment, right? Okay. So we know now that a single atom can have a magnetic moment. You can go these these this kind of thing, you can go on like Wikipedia or to any type of like different types of websites where they record data about like masses and spins and all kinds of different things about particles. And you can go find the magnetic moment of a hydrogen atom, the magnetic moment of a helium atom, the magnetic moment of any atom you want to. You can find the magnetic moment of a single electron. Even a single electron has a magnetic moment. Uh, you can go find the magnetic moment of neutrons, etc., etc. Okay. So magnetic moment is a property of kind of all matter. Now, given that we understand that a single atom can have a magnetic moment, let's think about what a permanent magnet is now. So inside of a bar magnet, for example, what happens is that there are, they call them domains or regions in which you have different atoms lining up in different ways, okay? So let's say that we consider 
this arrow to represent a magnetic moment for any particular piece of our bar magnet. What we're going to find is there are going to be regions where there are a whole bunch of magnetic moments that all point kind of relatively in the same direction. Okay, so there's going to be different regions within here where the magnetic moment kind of points all in different directions. So each of these arrows is going to represent a magnetic moment. They're not all pointing exactly in the same direction, but they roughly might be pointing kind of something like this. You just get these different domains where you get different directions of magnetic fields and more magnetic moments of the atoms themselves. So every one of these little arrows right here, we're thinking of as being for a single atom or group of atoms, okay? So inside of a bar magnet, you might have some kind of shape like this. And just to keep it simple, let's break it down into just two over here. Maybe, maybe in this region, all of your magnetic moments are kind of aligned like this. Maybe in this region, they're kind of aligned like this. Okay, so we call these domains. This is called a domain. It doesn't really matter. Here's the point. The reason why a bar magnet is magnetized is because the majority of the magnetic moments of the atoms within the bar magnet, on average, is pointing in this direction here, which makes it so that this is the north end of the magnet and this is the south end of the magnet. Okay, now that's not to say that every single electron and every single atom is lined up perfectly with the external, with the field that's created. It's just that on average, most of the atoms have a magnetic moment that are pointing to the right. If let's say 51% of the atoms have a component that points to the right and 49 have a, a component that points to the left, when you add up all those things, the net effect is that you're going to have a magnetic field that points off to the right like this. And that's ultimately what makes bar magnets is the current flowing around these little atoms kind of lines up in certain ways until the average magnetic field uh, points in a certain direction. And um, that's pretty much what a magnet is. It's pretty much what a magnet is. Can you see now why it is that we can't have magnetic monopoles? Can you see now why? Because if I have this, this circulating current and it produces a magnetic moment, that magnetic moment has basically a south end and a north end to it itself. You know what I mean? This is like, this is basically like just a little bar magnet. So even single atoms have dipole magnetic fields, which is why we say you can't actually find magnetic monopoles. Okay, does anyone have any questions? Okay, let's talk about motors. So we said that uh, if you place a loop of wire that has current inside of it into a magnetic field, there will be an effect that causes it to rotate somewhat similar from what's happening in this picture from A to B. Let's see what's happening here. So we've got a EMF right here. We've got a battery. It produces current. That current flows over to here. It flows into the red side of this loop. So the current goes into here, it goes around this side, it then comes back in this way, okay? And you should be able to prove to yourself, as shown on the picture, that that's gonna have a magnetic moment that's going to tend to point straight down, right? Because you can wrap your fingers in the direction of the current and your thumb points straight down, okay? 
Now, because the magnetic moment points down and the magnetic field points this way, there's going to be a torque, which we can do mu cross b. And that torque is going to point this direction. And it means that this system is going to feel a torque that tends to cause it to rotate up in this direction here until the magnetic moment vector points parallel to the magnetic field. So that's the theory. Does that part make sense to you all? This orange vector wants to point until it's in the same direction as B. That orange vector is effectively connected to the direction that this loop is pointing and the current, the direction of the current through it. So this loop is going to rotate up this way and down this way until the orange mu vector points in the same direction as B. That's what we learned from our, our previous section, right? Does that make sense to everyone? Is this picture clear? Just the just the part where the red and the blue wires are at least. Now, we said before that if all we had, let's go back to what we were just discussing. If all we had was a loop with an axis running through the loop, we said that basically what would happen is the system would rotate through 90 degrees until it got to this position here, at which point there would be no more torque and the motion would stop, right? Now, what we're trying to produce down here is a DC motor. A DC motor, to define what it is, is a device that takes in current and turns it into rotational motion. From an energy standpoint, what it does is it takes electrical energy in the form of current and it converts the electrical energy into mechanical energy, the energy of motion, the energy of kinetic energy. And this is a very powerful thing to be able to do. If you can take electricity and turn it into motion, you can, uh, you can do all sorts of things. Okay, so the problem from what we had before is that in this case, what we described was only 90 degrees of rotational motion. Would you all agree? When you go from here to here, it's only rotated by 90 degrees. So that's not going to create circular motion. You're not going to be able to power a remote control car, for example, off of a motor like this. Because this motor, the car, what would happen is the wheels would just move like a quarter turn and then they would stop. That's not, that's not good. That's not... We can't do anything with that, right? So what we have to do is we have to construct something that fixes that problem, okay? And that's what this thing right here is. This commutator with these two brushes. So let's talk about how that works. So it says each brush is in contact with both commutator segments, so the current bypasses the rotor altogether. So what happens is that you'll notice that there's a split right here in this ring could make it just a little bit bigger, I think. Wouldn't hurt. Let me move this over so I can see what I'm blocking out, what I'm not blocking out. And if I do that, then it messes that up. I think we're fine though. I don't think it's blocking anything out. Okay. So the um, the split in the ring here and here. This is a split here and here, and the split occurs basically 90 degrees away from where the situation starts. These brushes are like metal brushes that create electrical contacts, but they're not electrical contacts like the ones you all have hooked up in the lab where, you know, if you took one of the circuits that you hooked up in the lab and you tried to rotate it around, the, the cables would just start to, to wrap into tied knots and stuff like that, right? So here what you have is a connection that is free to kind of be rotated by and 
basically the positive side is always connected to this brush and the negative side of the battery is always connected to this brush. And that's going to directly affect the current that's flowing here. So look what happens when we get to exactly 90 degrees. When we get to 90 degrees, what happens is that now the gap in the commutator is in contact with the brushes. And what that means is that there's no longer current actually flowing through here. The current stops flowing for a second. So it says each brush is in contact with both commutator segments, which is the, the open ring part. So the current bypasses the rotor altogether. The rotor is the, the metal loop here. Okay. As a result, no magnetic torque acts on the rotor. Now what's gonna happen? So if I had this object and it was rotating, and it rotated from this flat position over here on the left, and then it rotated up to this position like this. Once it gets to that point, if there's current flowing, it's not gonna move anymore. But if the current stops flowing because of the, the gap in this thing right here, what's gonna happen is the object had some kinetic energy, it had some momentum as it rolled to here, and that momentum is gonna allow it to push a little bit past that point. What's going to happen then is that the segment that was red before, let's look back at this. Red is positive, right? The red side is the positive side. That segment is now going to suddenly be connected because it's rolling in this direction to the negative side of the battery. Can you see that? So it's, it's, it's going around in a circle like this. It started here. It went up to this point. And that meant that the, the red side went down, the blue side went up, as you can see here. But now this red side is about to come into contact with the negative side of the battery. And the blue side is about to come into contact, this blue side right here is about to come into contact with the positive side of the battery. What's that going to do to the current through the loop? Compared to the direction it was flowing here, what's going to happen to the current through the loop now? Yeah, it effectively reverses the direction of the current. Exactly. So now what happens is that the side that had the current flowing this way, now has the side, the current's now gonna flow back the other direction, right? Because this, this blue thing, right? It's, it's rotating to the left. This blue thing is about to come into contact with this, and so now the current's gonna flow through the top here. And that's exactly what you can see in this picture right here. So now what's happened is that what was formerly the red side is now the blue side. The blue side is now in contact, whoops. The blue side is now in contact with the positive terminal of the battery, and now the current is flowing in the same direction as it was before. And what that does is it allows this situation to basically start to repeat itself. Because if you can get from picture one to picture two, and then back to this picture again, naturally, which you can with the way this is gonna work, then you can basically repeat the process, right? Because now you can go from here to here to here to here to here to here, and the system will basically just keep going in circles just by feeding, just by feeding electricity into it. That's all you have to do. Electricity here leads to rotational motion here, and then you can connect this to whatever you want to turn, right? At its core, this is what's happening inside of like a Tesla. You know, you have a battery, it sends electricity into something, that electricity gets converted into motion through some type of loops of wire, and then that motion makes the wheels turn basically, and that's it, it's just electricity, gets turned into mechanical energy. And I don't think this this representation here is particularly good. I didn't do a great job. But uh, but there are some videos where you that you can that you can see how this is happening. I'm gonna show you one that's on the that I put up on Canvas. There are plenty of different videos you can find that are like this. Um, this class is this class. I think it's on this. Oh maybe it's not. That's fine. Should be too hard to find on YouTube. There's more than one way to do this stuff. Well, I mean, that's a great question. Is uh, if if this is so simple, then then why are electric cars more rare? Well, you still have to carry the battery around, right? And the limitation with electric cars, um, 
I, this is the one I want to watch. This is a short one. That's really good. Um, this one's pretty good too. Yeah, this one's better, I think. Um, yeah, I think that's right, Justin. If you if you don't care about efficiency that much, if you don't care about if all you want to do is make a really powerful car like they did in the '60s, like the muscle cars and stuff like that, and you don't care about the emissions, I think I think he's right that, that you get a lot higher power output from a combustion engine. Um, that being said, I'm sure if you pump enough electricity out of a battery, you can probably get similar kind of power output. Anyway, let's watch this video. I'm gonna have to switch this over so you can hear the sound. Uh, change windows to this one. Go live. Maybe I'll turn this on so I can hear the sound too. You can find DC motors in many. Just want to say real quick the Lorentz law is the I L equal I L uh, force equal to I L cross B or Q V cross B. That's the Lorentz law. Go back a little bit. You will notice that as the coil rotates, the commutator rings connect with the power source of opposite polarity. As a result, on the left side of the coil, the electricity will always flow away, and on the right side, electricity will always flow towards. So this is the key thing. This auteur. I should have muted myself, but this is the key thing here. So I'm just going to, I can't go back through it. What I want you all to look at on this thing is watch what happens to this arrow right here. So you see it's pointing this direction and the force is up. Watch what happens to the direction of that arrow when it gets past the 180 degree mark, like when it crosses this point. Always flow towards. Do you see that? Always flow towards. See how it switches? Flow towards, flow towards, and that's will always flow away. Let me mute this guy. Um, so the key thing is that, like, what's happening here is that, like, if you look at this piece right here and you watch that arrow, you can tell exactly when it flips. So when it gets to the top right here, if you look at what's happening here, it's right when that thing switches. So anyway, okay, I'll shut up. The electricity will.
whoops. I'm gonna let this play, but I'm just gonna say that this is, he's definitely getting into things that we're gonna be learning about in the next chapter, so it's okay if you're, but it doesn't hurt to watch it. A rotating loop in magnetic field will produce an EMF according to the principle of electromagnetic induction. The case of rotating armature loops is also the same. An internal EMF will be induced that opposes the applied input voltage. The back EMF reduces armature current by a large amount. Back EMF is proportional to the speed of the rotor. At the starting of the motor, back EMF is too low, thus the armature current becomes too high, leading to the burnout of the rotor. Thus, a proper starting mechanism that controls the applied input voltage is necessary in large DC motors. One of the interesting variations of the DC motor is a universal motor, which is capable to run under both AC and DC power sources. To know more about it, please check the next video. Thank you. Okay. Did you all find that helpful? I kept forgetting to mute my mic. Was it picking up my audio whenever I didn't mute my mic? Was it picking it up out of my speakers? Well, that's going to sound terrible on the recording, but that's okay. Sorry about that. I don't know how to... We're going to OBS. Go live. And we go back to you. Okay, any questions? And mostly I just wanted to show you the animation because when you can see, like, the vectors changing, like... You can only see so much in a picture that only shows you three steps, right? But the key is to understanding that um, right as soon as you switch from here to there, the the torque is going to uh, is going to make it so that the system just keeps rotating, and that's the key. That's the key to understanding what's happening here with the DC motor. Okay, so pretty powerful concept. Um, you can you can take electricity and you can turn it into mechanical energy. You heard in the video that there are some complications such as back EMF. We will learn about that in two weeks from now. We'll learn about Faraday's law and Lindsay's law. But yeah, there we go. I think that that's the end of this chapter. Um, and I think we're going to move on to talking about uh, magnetic forces now. So the question is, do we take another break? We could. It's kind of a short segment, but taking a break right now makes sense. It'll give us more time to really delve into magnetic forces. So let's do that. Let's take another 10 minute break. So we'll start again at uh, four or three fifty three twenty six.